Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers of against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take unto you the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything to stand. Stand firm. Verse 14, stand firm, therefore. And it goes on. We're going to look at each of these verses. Going back to verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might. I, I always think of this in light of not being strong in yourself. Not trying to compete in this spiritual uh, warfare that we're all engaged in, whether we acknowledge it or not. It is a reality. We want to be strong in the Lord. In the context of this, in the book of Ephesians, the Lord we're talking about is Jesus. You want to be strong in Jesus and uh, and your, your faith and your confidence and your trust and his leading you and guiding you through every day so that you can stand firm in this very evil day. And we have good reason to trust in Jesus because he's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. He's above all, both good and evil. He's above all of course, God is above him, but Jesus is at the right hand of God. So to be strong in the Lord is a very wise thing to do. Verse, verse 11 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand in the firm day against the schemes of the devil. It talks about putting on the, the full armor of God. And this, this whole thing that we're looking at is an analogy that was relevant in their time. We're talking about a soldier and the equipment that a soldier would wear. He would have his loins girt about in a certain way. He would have a breastplate on where they would metal thing, right? And they'd have a helmet and, you know, and, and I guess some kind of uh, footwear. And uh, today, we, same thing with the soldier today. They wear helmets and they, instead of uh, metal, they have uh, bulletproof vests and, and army boots and all the rest. So this analogy is not so much getting caught up in the, uh, you know, the armor as much as what it represents. And, and what it said here is, put on the full armor of God. You don't want to go into the battlefield forgetting your helmet or forgetting your bulletproof vest. You put on the full armor of God. And in this particular section, there are, there are seven or eight things that are mentioned here that we are to put on. Put on the truth, uh, live righteously, and... Um, Maintain peace, your feet, be in charge with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Then faith, that is the shield that sets off all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And hope, we have the hope in our minds. God, and then we speak God's word. And then prayer. We're going to look at each of these because they're all important in order to continue to stand in this very evil day that we live in. Again, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, hope, God's word. And prayer. Because, as that verse 11 said, so that we may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. You know, I wonder how many people really believe that there is a devil. I wonder, you know, it's, it's portrayed to us that it's a myth and it's not real. But if, if you have any spiritual insight at all, if you read the Bible at all, if you live life as a Christian, you understand that there is a devil. And for me, it was just as important for me to learn that Jesus Christ was my Lord, that there was a devil that was causing all the evil that was in the world. And it talks about the methods of the devil, or the schemes of the devil, or the methods, it's the, the Greek word is methods of the devil. And they are subtlety, secrecy, illusion, disguise, lies. It talks about it, talks about it in Corinthians, where, where we're not to be deceived like Eve was deceived by the devil by his subtlety, uh, so that we would lose the simplicity that is in Christ. He's very subtle, subtle, deceiving, very, it's, it's uh, very deceptive. He does this by, most often by secrecy, so that you don't even understand that it is the devil doing what's happening. The circumstances, the situations, the other person's behavior, even your own behavior, 
you don't understand that this is being manipulated behind the scenes by the evil one. He operates in secret. If we would see the devil in the way that he really does look, there's none of us that would be deceived or taken in by him because he's so evil and so gross. But that's not the way he presents it himself. He presents himself in a, in a fashion that's like an illusion. It looks so good. It, oh, you, come on, you can take a little bit of this. It's going to feel so good. It's going to taste great. Oh, try this. Come on. Oh, this is good. Come on in here. That's the way it works. And it's an illusion. Then once you get in there, you know, it just devours you, you know. <laughs> so he works in illusions. And then the other, of course, great disguise. And he's the master of lies. You go right back to the beginning of the Bible, right back to Genesis where it all started, where man fell. The way that Eve was deceived was the devil told her a lie. God does know that the day you eat thereof, you will become like him. It was a lie. And she bought into that lie. And that's the way he has worked ever since. He gets people to believe lies, lies about themselves, lies about others, lies about the world we live in, lies most importantly about the true God. So this is not something we want to engage in on our own. We really want the help of our Lord Jesus Christ and, of course, of God our Father. Verse 12, again, in 6.12, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Look at chapter 2. I'm, I'm pretty much going to stay right here in the book of Ephesians to explain these different things to you. Because <clears throat> when, the, when the epistle of Ephesians was sent to the people at Ephesus, it wasn't with the rest of the Bible. They got this letter, and they had to interpret, well, what does, what does it mean to put on the armor of God? And the way to do that would be to go back into the epistle and see where it talks about the subject at hand. And it talks about these uh, w spiritual wickedness quite a bit. In Ephesians chapter 2, for example, it says, We were all dead in trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is working in the sons of disobedience. That's quite a phrase, isn't it? The prince of the power of the air. The one thing we know about air is it's everywhere present. You know, it's, it's influencing all of us all of the time. And we're given the impression that there is this evil that the devil is generating that's constantly around us, and we need to know how to cope with this. We need to know how to deal with this. He's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all had our lifestyle in time past in the lusts of the flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. There's really three things talked about in these three verses. It's talking about the influences of the world upon us, that the world we live in is an evil world, and there's a lot of things that are pressing on us and trying to, you know, deceive us. And then the devil himself, the prince of the power of the air, and then our own lust, our own self-desires that we're all born with, you know, the, the, the desires of the flesh. Look at um, chapter 4 in verse 26. Again, we're looking at what Ephesians says about our enemy and who we're fighting against. In 426, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. In this specific verse here, it's talking about how anger, an explosive anger that you would have, opens up the door for the devil to start harassing you. There's other things, there's other sins that do the same thing. That if we allow these things in our lives, it opens up ourselves to be evilly influenced by the devil. And then, um, where were we here? 427. Well, let's go back to... Um, Verse 1, or chapter 1. Well, let's look at chapter 5. I'm sorry. Chapter 5 is another place that it's talked about. I lost my 
myself for a minute. But I found myself. I looked here, I looked there, I looked everywhere. I found myself. I'm finally here. I'm right here, right here now. Where am I? I'm right here. Wendy, what am I talking about? I don't know either. Chapter 5, verse 14. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. I don't know if you've noticed this, but these are evil days that we live in. It says in Galatians chapter 1 that we have been rescued from this very present evil age. Now, having looked at all of this, this is kind of a daunting reality that we have we have this spiritual wickedness that's constantly endeavoring to harass us and lead us away from God. But there is some very good news. And if you turn to chapter 1, in this prayer in chapter 1, we're told that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. In verse 19, And what is the surpassing greatness of God's power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might, which He, God, brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principal, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put Jesus above all things in subjection under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. That fills all in all. Again, this is very good news. And, and the, the primary reason that we should have strength in Jesus, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, because he has been raised from the dead and he is above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he's the head of the church, and we can be strong in him, and he's much bigger than the devil, and all the all of the the methodology and all that the devil represents to us, he is bigger than that. And if we do what he says for us to do, then we can be victorious. And again, he lays out for us these seven things that we should be doing in our lives. And I, I guess I wanted to show you that slide. Really, we, we, we think that we're wrestling against flesh and blood, but really what's behind the scenes, what's pulling our strings and manipulating us is these evil powers of the devil. But the good news is, is that Jesus is above all of that, and we can be strong in him. Go back to chapter 6, please. Chapter 6. Therefore, verse 13, therefore take unto you the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand. So again, we're told to put on, the second time we're told to put on the full armor of God. And again, these, these things that are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things are how we put on the full armor of God. And the, and the purpose for doing this is so that we can stand. Verse 13, resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore. And again, that's something that's repeated three times. Go back to verse 11. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm. And then in verse 13, the latter part of verse 13, stand firm. And then in verse 14, stand firm. I, you know, maybe Paul thought that we were not very smart and needed to be told over and over again. The point here is to stand firm, not to cop out, not to quit, not to give up, not to run away from God when things get hard, not to be a loser in, in the sense of your relationship with God and giving up on your faith. You know, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to stand firm when life is going good. I've been studying the book of Psalms lately, and particularly the, David being a writer of so many of the Psalms. You know, when, when he killed Goliath, it must have been very easy for him to stand strong, shoulders back, feeling good about himself, and when he went out and fought against the Philistines and he killed thousands of them, he must have felt pretty good about himself and it would have been very easy to... St Actually, when he came into town and the people were singing about him, 
I think it might have been pretty easy for him to stand firm. But then again, there was that sin that he committed with Bathsheba, where he, he had sex with her and ended up murdering her husband. I imagine after he was confronted by Nathan, that standing firm then was a little bit more difficult. When he was confronted with the reality of his sin and how he had betrayed God and how he had disobeyed God, how he had disgraced God, I imagine then it was much harder to stand firm. It would have been much easier to run into a bottle of booze and to drown his sorrows and feel sorry for himself. But instead, what David did, he stood firm. He asked God for forgiveness. He turned to God. He, he, he repented of his sin, and he asked God to have mercy on him. And he stood even in that tragic time. And, you know, when his, when his one son ended up raping his daughter, I imagine at that time it was hard to stand firm. And, and when his other son murdered that, uh, that brother of his, I imagine that was a hard time to stand too. No matter what happened in this man's life, good, bad, tragic, he stood firm. He didn't give up. What about you? What about me? Are we cowards? Are we going to run when we have a little pain and things don't go? Well, I prayed, and he didn't answer my prayers. No, I'm not going to come around no more. I don't like the way Peter sang that song. I'm just tired of that song. He just went on and on and on and on. I'm going to go to the church down the road, see what they got. Well, I get down there, and I don't like what they do. They don't have good refreshments or anything. I'm quitting. Nobody can look at me like that. Finnegan looks at me. That guy never smiles. That's the lame excuses that so many people have had over the years for not standing firm. We don't want to be like that. We want to stand firm to bring glory and honor to our God and our Father. It reminds me of, um, you know, this is Super Bowl Sunday about, about the... Um, this guy, you know, they, they have these radio things where they give away free Super Bowl tickets. They have them all, all the time, you know. And last year, some guy won the Super Bowl ticket. He gets to the Super Bowl, and, you know, he's all excited. He's finally at the big game, the first time in his life. He's sitting up in the stand, and he's like, you know, way terrible seats. And, you know, he said, I could have stayed home and watched this on TV. And he thinks to himself, well, I'm, I'm going to see if there's a seat up further. And I get closer up to the uh, thing. So he, he looking, he looking. After the first quarter, he gets up and he sees there's a box seat and there's a guy, there's an empty seat and this guy's sitting right next to him. So he goes down there to the guy and he says, is there anybody sitting here? The man says, no. And, and the guy says, how come nobody's sitting here? He says, well, this is my wife's seat. We've been coming to the Super Bowl together for 20, 30 years and, um, you know, she's not here. He said, well, why isn't she here? He said, well, she died. He said, oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, well... Things happen. He said, he said uh, couldn't you find a, a, a relative or a friend to come with you? He said, no, I couldn't find any of them. And I, I got plenty of relatives. I got plenty of friends, but the, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> now, as it goes over the crowd... <laughs> Bob, this is what we do out at church here. So Bob Marilyn, this first time they're here, and probably going to be the last time after these terrible jokes. <laughs> so um, back to the Bible. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins, verse 14, girding your loins with truth. Girding your loins with truth. Your loins are this section. You know, that's your, it's from your pelvis up to your, your ribs, it's where you're, you know, people often have back pain. That's because it's a very important part of you. Have your loins girt about with truth. Go to chapter 4. It talks about this in chapter 4, verse 21. If indeed you have heard him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupt in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. 
You know, Jesus, Jesus said, if you are my disciples, you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? It will make you free. And if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The truth sets you free. Obviously, the Scriptures contain the truth. But there's, there's also a different way or an additional way of thinking about it. There are lies that all of us believe about ourself, that lies from our childhood on up that we carry with us into our adult life. Like there's something wrong with us, I'm inferior, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good looking enough, I'm not, I'm not this, I, I'm lacking in this, I'm lacking in that. There's lies that we believe that get embedded in our lives as children. And all the way back when, you know, and, and it's not anybody else's fault except for the devil. He gets people to believe lies about themselves. Then when we become a Christian and we read what the scriptures say about us, and we still feel that bad about ourselves. We're embracing the lie rather than the truth. The truth of the matter is, as is so wonderfully communicated in the book of Ephesians, God has called you to be his child. He has redeemed you. He has sanctified you. He has, he has given you life in his family. You are a child of God. There is no reason for you to any longer embrace the lie that you're lacking something. You're not lacking anything. The creator of the heavens of the earth loves you, wants you to be with him in eternity. How could you feel bad about yourself? Because you believe lies. We need to embrace the truth in order to be set free. We need to embrace the truth about each other. You know, I, I, I was telling somebody yesterday that when I first came around, you know, I, I, I was a street kid. I, I wasn't, you know, had a lot of fights and that type of thing. And I first came around, I, I went to a meeting, and I, I go, and this guy, introdu I introduce myself to this guy, and I'm uncomfortable. I'm not, you know, I'm not a church kind of person. I'm uncomfortable. I said, hi, my name is Vince. He says, hey, how you doing, buddy? I said, no, my, my name is not Buddy. My name is Vince. He said, okay, Buddy. I, what? Are you, are you trying to push me here or what? You know, and then uh, I said, okay. I backed up, and I thought, uh, never mind what I thought. <laughs> uh, I was new. But I had to learn that people our people. And we all have our, our own idiosyncrasies. We all have our own annoyances, our own blessings. And I had to learn that people are just like me and that we're all, you know, we're all struggling in life and we all have different things. And when somebody calls you buddy, it's really no big deal. Right, buddy? <laughs> so I ended up being friends with this guy, but man, he... And of course, the, I, I, that, I saw him that day, and the next time I saw him, he said, hey, how you doing, buddy? <laughs> My point is, we believe lies about each other, lies that segregate us, or you know, that cause division, that cause hatred, just because of the way we look, or where we're from, or the way we talk. Those are all lies. People are people. You, there's two kinds of people, people that have God and people that don't have God. That's it. Keep it that simple. So we have lies. Then we have lies about the world. Oh, my goodness. Turn on the TV. Which news channel do you want to hear? Turn on uh, Fox, listen to theirs, then turn it over and listen to ABC, NBC, and the complete opposite. Somebody's not telling the truth. <laughs> Somebody's lying somewhere. The world we live in. We want to embrace the truth. Loins gird about with truth. And the next thing in Ephesians is um, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. If you turn to chapter 5, please, or chapter 4, in verse 32. The breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is what covers your heart. And basically, righteousness in this context is, is, is not necessarily uh, acknowledging what Christ accomplished for you, which is a part of it, but it's living the right way, living, living a godly life. You can't, you cannot, if you don't want the adversary pushing you around and destroying you, you got to do what the word says to do. You got to do the, the simple ABCs of like in chapter four, chapter four, verse 24, that you put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. 
Stop lying. Speak the truth with each other, which is neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Be angry and don't sin. Don't have an outburst of anger. Don't, don't give place to the devil. Verse 28. You who stole, stop doing that. No more stealing. Rather work, labor, performing what is good with your own hands so that you may have something to share with other people. Do not let no unwholesome words proceed out from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for the edification according to the need. Let words that come out of your mouth build people up, not tear them down, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed from the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Instead of being that way, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even just as God has forgiven you in Christ. So we need to live this word. If we don't live the word, if we don't embrace the truths of these, our armor is not going to be all the way up, and the devil is going to have a field day with us. And then your feet shod, verse 15, 615, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet shod with your, the preparation of the gospel of peace. That means where you go, you bring peace. And in Ephesians chapter 2, there's a whole section in there talking about how what Jesus accomplished on the cross was so that you, you could have peace with God. Prior to that time, you didn't have peace with God. And also it talks about how you can have peace with other people. In particular, it's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one new man so that there would be peace. So, you know, that we, we no longer have to have enmity with God and fighting with God, and we don't have to have fights with other people. Wherever you go, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Bring peace with you. Don't bring strife and contention and, and you know, don't, don't be pugnacious. Let it go. It's not that important. Have peace. It's, of, it's often, it's very difficult to have peace in your world if you don't have peace in your heart. And if you don't have peace in your heart, take the time that's necessary to get that peace. Get your relationship with God in order and embrace the peace. Be still and know that I am God. Let that peace be a part of who you are. And then you be the peacemaker instead of the one that's always causing the strife. That's why it says in chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It takes unity. You know, God hasn't really appointed you as being the judge or the policeman of the body of Christ. It isn't your responsibility to go around trying to change everybody else. You've got the responsibility of changing one person, your spouse. <laughs> no, no, that, wait a minute. That came out wrong. That's not right. That's not right. Yourself. You can only change yourself. We got to be at peace with other people. In order to have be at peace with other people, mind your own business, tend your own garden, do your own stuff. Stop judging. Mind your none of your business. Let God take care of them. Love people. Love your enemies. If you're going to love your enemies, you can't be constantly reaffirming in your mind why they are your enemy. You know, it says, "Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you." So. Have peace with your fellow man. Then the next thing in Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which will, you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The, the helmet of, or the shield, what is it? The shield of faith, that's the thing you hold up so that when the, the fiery darts of the evil one comes, he can't penetrate you. Here's the, kind of, here, here's the kind of darts or arrows, fiery arrows that the devil will throw at you. You're stupid. You're no good. Nobody likes you. 
you're not important. And after you sin, what a bum you are. I can't believe you're doing that. After you've been saved, you turn around and sin. Guilt, condemnation. You don't belong here. These are the kind of fiery darts that people have to contend with. We all do. And the way you contend with them is by faith. What does that mean? You believe what is written in Ephesians about your God, about your Lord. Your Lord died on the cross so that you could identify with him. You now have Christ in you, and that's who you are. You are a child of God. You identify with what is written in the scripture and claim it as your own. That's what faith is. Faith is believing what the word of God says and doing it, living by it. And that's how those, when those lies come at you, you combat them. And that's all they are is lies. And then the next thing is the take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The helmet of salvation, the helmet is on the head. The salvation that is talked about in Ephesians is what happens when Jesus Christ comes back. The kingdom is coming. Christ is coming back. You know, yeah, we live in an evil day, but there's a day coming that's going to last for eternity that we want to embrace in our mind. That's how we get through the craziness of this this world is understanding we're just passing through we're on our way to another kingdom that's coming and then the sword of the spirit which is the word of God the sword of the spirit which is the word of God I don't know what I this clock doesn't work so I don't know if I've been going for 10 minutes or a half hour or an hour can somebody tell me Say what, Jim? What's 11.50? That's, I don't need to know what time it is. I need to know how long I've been doing this. You don't care. Look, there's this woman that went to the Super Bowl. No, I, should I? With her boyfriend. Rick, this is for you. And... Um, they got box seats right behind the team. I mean, they got the best seats in the stadium. And the game's over. The guy says to his girlfriend, do you enjoy the game? She said, well, you know, I really love the outfits, the colors that the players wore and the, their muscles and everything else. She says, quite, quite frankly, I don't, I don't get the whole thing. She said, what do you, he said, what do you mean you don't get the whole thing? She said, well, in the middle, the beginning of the game, they went out in the middle of the field, they flip a quarter up in the air, and then somebody must have took the quarter, I don't know, and then they start playing, and then for the rest of the game, they keep on saying, get the quarterback, get the quarterback, get the quarterback. <laughs> she says, it's 25 cents, it's no big deal, what are you... You should have told me I had no time left. <laughs> so the sword of the Spirit, verse 17, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Uh, Eduardo read this earlier from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Talking about the Word of God piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit and the, the, both the joints and the marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word of God is like a sword. It's powerful in dividing. Jeremiah says, It is not my word, is, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like the hammer which shatters the rock. The word of God is powerful it's active it's quick now it said that the the take the sword of the spirit which is the word of god on the day of pentecost when the holy spirit was first given peter got up and he started speaking the word he quoted from the book of joel he quoted some from the psalms about david and he spoke the word to the people and and it says at the end of his preaching peter and the other apostles at the end of the, pre, the of his teaching the people said well, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? It pierced their heart. See, the word, the word, I don't know how to say this. The word is the, uh, the conduit for the spirit to pierce the heart. It wasn't the word alone that convicted those people. It's the spirit that convicts the people. 
That's why some people, some people, they hear the word of God and it just goes right over the head. It doesn't have any impact at all. Some of us, I mean, the first time somebody read the Bible and I heard the Bible, it was like they punched me in the stomach. It was like, whoa, what was that? It just pierced my heart. That's the spirit. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. When the word of God is spoken, it has power to it. That's why Sean, a couple of weeks ago, made mention of why our, our church is all about the Bible. We teach the Bible. We teach the Word because we believe that the Word of God is indeed the, you know, that powerful thing that it is. And, uh, you know, that when Jesus was tempted, he didn't do what Eve did. He spoke to the devil the Word, and the Word of God backed down all those temptations. The Word of God is extremely, it's the sword of the Spirit, the Word. Isn't that a great picture? In Psalms 107, it says, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. It's the word that will deliver us from their destructions. Psalm 119, May your loving kindness also come to me, O Yahweh, your salvation according to your word. Salvation comes according to His word. 1 Peter 1.23, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring Word of God. You get born again by hearing and believing this Word of God. Born again, you get eternal life from believing this Word of God. How powerful is it? How essential is it? How vital is it for this to be a part of our life, not something that's separate from our life? This is something that we live on on a daily basis. And then the last thing of these is verse 18, 618, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit with this in view. Be on alert with all perseverance and, and petition for all saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For, for this great epistle to end with the exhortation, but specifically Paul's asking them to pray for him. But this great epistle has in it two of the, of the most wonderful prayers the Christian church has. In Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3, these are uh, the two of the, of the most uh, profound prayers that God wants all of us to pray on a regular basis. And I'll leave that to you to evaluate and look at on your own because they are extremely, extremely important prayers. These are things that you can be well assured of God is going to answer because he wrote the prayer for you to pray. You're not going to combat the evil one without prayer. So you have your loins girt about with truth. You have, your, you have the breastplate of righteousness. You start living the right way. You have your feet prepared with the gospel of peace. Wherever you go, you have peace. You bring peace within and you bring it to where you go. And then you have the shield of faith by which you quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And then you have the helmet of salvation. You have the hope on in your mind. And then the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, all of it under, undergirded by prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving to us the opportunity to live in this evil day and to stand and not compromise, to stand strong in, in you and in our Lord. Thank you for enabling us in this fashion. We love you and we praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.